welcome to the Royal Statistical Society Social Statistics Section event on survey research and new forms of data. I am Olga Maslowska and I'm a lecturer at the Department of Social Statistics and Demography at the University of Southampton. I'm also a PI on ESRC project which funds activities of GenPOP Web2 network. And this network brings together partners to address various issues associated with transitioning from uh, traditional face-to-face -face surveys to online data collection. I'm also RSS Social Statistics Committee member. So a couple of words about the event today. The event today will be recorded. So please, if you change your mind about of some of the comments, you would like them not to appear on the final recordings, which will be released, please email either me or Alex. And so, OK, somebody saying audio is working fine. OK, great. <clears throat> so the event, uh, as I said, the, 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 the event is being recorded. And if, if somebody would like some editing to the final version, please let us know. And those will be adjusted before the final version will be released. So today we have three excellent presentations from, uh, from the experts in the area of new forms of data. So each presentation will take about 20 minutes and this time will we'll include some time for clarification questions. Please post your clarification questions to the chat box. Then after our third presentation, we will invite all presenters to a discussion se session and discussion session will be led by Alex Chernat from the who is a senior lecturer in the, at the Department of Social Statistics at the University of Manchester. So during that session, you can either place your questions to the chat box or you can raise your hand. And then you, uh, during that session, also we will invite all our presenters to take part in the discussion session. So we'll ask them to, uh, to put the cameras on again and unmute themselves. So during the presentations, I would like to ask all participants to switch their cameras off and to mute them uh, yourselves. Yeah, just to make sure that we could hear presentations very well. I think that was everything I wanted to talk about housekeeping. So now it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Bella Struminskaya from the Department of Methods and Statistics at Utrecht University. And Bella's uh, title of her presentation today is Data Collection Using Smartphone Sensors and Apps, Understanding Participants Sharing Decisions and Assessing Non-Response Bias. Over to you, Bella. Thank you so much. Um, great to be here. Um, I don't see anyone, but I saw a lot of familiar names. And uh, my presentation today is on collecting uh, smartphone sensor data and why people are willing to do so or uh, not willing to do so. Um, and before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge a lot of people on this slide uh, who are from Utrecht University, from Statistics Netherlands, but also um, colleagues from Germany and the US who were involved in the studies that I'm going to talk about. So um, smartphones are practically um, an everyday thing now. Uh, I bet that every one of you uh, listening has a smartphone and it's in the vicinity of you, so you would need to walk less than five minutes to get it. And that's probably true uh, about uh, most of the people uh, in the world. And um, with this proliferation of smartphones and accessibility of them and using uh, them by people for everyday things, researchers are also getting excited about using them as research tools. So um, on this slide, I have um, a timeline of how sensors in smartphones evolved. And if you look at this uh, from 2010 until 2020, we've come from about uh, six uh, sensors um, in an off the shelf smartphone to about 16 now. And there has been a lot of research. Sorry, my slides are advancing. Yes, um, there has been a lot of research done with smartphone apps and sensors, and this is just a cherry picked uh, number of studies uh, that I uh, looked uh, 
up and um, some of the studies focus on special populations such as children who are um, who cannot express themselves verbally but can take pictures or paralyzed recently released from prisons uh, who are pretty mobile so that's a great thing to use smartphones to track their behavior and see how they find work but other studies um, are based on volunteers and their goal is not to study special populations but generalize to the population to the general smartphone using population i'm just going to pick one of those here um, no offense to this study um, but it was published pretty prominently and uh, what the researchers did was that uh, they uh, wanted to see how um, unequal is physical activity um, across different countries and uh, what they did is that, that they used data from volunteers who downloaded a particular fitness app on their phones and uh, looked at how many steps they took daily. So uh, a lot of you are familiar with this paradigm, the total survey error paradigm, which is here mapped on the survey life cycle that um, has a lot of uh, errors. So we are going to look at this study um, with the total survey error in mind. So first off, um, the uh, researchers only use data from iPhone users. That would be not problematic if iPhone users would not be different from, um, for example, Android users or other smartphone uh, models, but this is not the case. So there are studies, uh, for example, by Florian Koch and German data, which show that there are um, differences between operating systems in socioeconomic characteristics, for example, for people. Then also they only focused on volunteers, so volunteers who probably want to, uh, for their behaviors to be, um, who are conscious about, about their behavior and uh, health. Um, and then um, only those who downloaded the app, and they did waiting, but uh, are the characteristics known of those uh, who are smartphone users in the population. That's not the case for all countries. There's also some measurement difficulties, but I'm going to talk about the representation. So here, this is the same picture, but flipped. So what I'm looking at is the total survey error, but uh, from, the, uh, from the big data perspective. So with Statistics Netherlands, we call this um, uh, designed big data, where you start from a population registry or for countries who don't have them, a, a sampling frame, draw a sample. Uh, some people are respondents. Some of them don't have smartphones known covered. Some of them are not respondents. And then you ask them to participate in sensor or app studies. Some of them participate, some of them don't. And then you get sensor data from them. And what the benefit is, is that we can assess the errors on each and every step of the way. And today I'm focusing on this non-consent or non-participation error. So what do we know about the willingness to share and actually share in the um, passively collected data or actively collected data such as pictures um, or videos and passive, uh, I could, uh, um, uh, I have an example here for GPS location. So what we know is that the willingness varies by sensor. There's a lot of numbers on this slide, don't focus on them that much. It also varies by country um, and willingness to download an app uh, is generally lower. But if we look at all these willingness rates, um, they are not very high. So for example, in the Netherlands, where the smartphone um, usage is uh, about 90, or smartphone penetration is about 90%, only 35% agreed to uh, download a travel app of Statistics Netherlands and uh, uh, register for this study. Not so high. So um, the question is uh, for today, what mechanisms um, uh, are responsible for willingness to share and uh, actually sharing smart and, um, smartphone and uh, app data. I'm going to uh, talk about three studies which are quite similar and um, they focused on willingness to share and uh, the third study on actually sharing. The first one was um, conducted by Florian Koch, um, myself and colleagues uh, on a German data and we asked people about their willingness to download a trapping app, a tracking app. They were non-probability panel respondents. And uh, they got the vignettes uh, with random assignment to different factors. Uh, so uh, let's look how this vignette looked like um, and what factors we varied. So the factor was sponsor, um, then the topic, 
um, duration, one month versus six months, um, the control or autonomy over data collection so that a person could switch off an app or not, incentive, and then also additional questionnaires. And furthermore, we asked people about their privacy concerns, technical, technological skills, uh, previous experience, and survey experience. The Dutch studies uh, to, uh, on the right are uh, quite similar. Um, they asked uh, not to download an app, but to share GPS photos and videos. The first one didn't specify how, and the second one um, uh, was in browser. So with the first one, it was also hypothetical. Would you share it or not? And with the second one, it was actual. And the first one was the probability-based panel, list panel, the second one, uh, was the cross-section of the population. There is an asterisk because uh, it was people who already participated in one of the surveys of Statistics Netherlands. Um, similar logic with vignettes, uh, varied factors for sponsor, autonomy over data collection, benefit framing that the survey would take longer if they shared the uh, sensor data, and also confidentiality assurance, so um, that the data would be treated confidentially, it would not be accessible by uh, third parties and so forth. In the um, actual study, the order of requests, the order of tasks was fixed. In the uh, German study and um, the list panel study, uh, the uh, requests were randomized. And um, this here is how the um, uh, study which actually um, collected sensor data looked like. So you can see, um, I'm sorry for those who don't read Dutch, um, I'm not going to translate this lengthy text, but uh, you can read it up in the in the papers. So this was the screen um, with the general consent question, uh, which um, basically asked that in addition to survey data, we would like to collect data uh, from sensors on smartphones or tablets and ask for the uh, uh, permission to do so. And uh, this was for the location. And um, the second panel here are the experimental uh, factors. So here all three of them are shown. Um, this was a two by two by two design. So the respondent either was shown the benefit framing or not and so forth. And oh, sorry, um, the GPS measurement, um, if they said yes, I would like to share my location, they were shown their location, had to click yes or no. And this was for photos or videos. So um, there are differences in designs of those studies, but uh, some of the mechanisms we tested are similar. So I'm going to focus on this on sponsor, control or autonomy over data collection, uh, order and uh, privacy concerns, technological skills and other characteristics. So what are the willingness to share rates and sharing rates? For the German study, um, about 35% would download an app and it was pretty U-shaped um, for um, all of the vignettes. So um, either tending to be not willing or tending to be willing. For the first Dutch study, um, the list panel study, we had um, uh, also uh, rates uh, of uh, GPS about 30%. Um, the um, others were uh, less, the photos and videos and fitness bracelet was quite high, although the similar um, sensor, GPS sensor. For the um, willingness in the um, study which actually implemented those, the GPS was highest, so uh, about 70% said that they were willing and then about 80% um, of those shared. So overall about 45% shared their GPS. What's interesting about this one is that um, those people who said that they're willing to share photos and video also actually did them. So 100% uh, of those who said I'm willing to share, shared. So these rates are both willingness and um, um, sharing um, percentages. So what what uh, mechanisms are responsible? First, the COISH study. Um, the um, sponsor, so here you can see the graph with O's ratios, so everything which is uh, higher than one uh, means a higher willingness, everything that's lower than one is lower willingness. And uh, we see that the sponsor is significant, so relative to market research, people were more likely to share, to be willing to share data with the university and less, less willing to share um, data with the government agency. Um, and then uh, the order of the vignettes uh, was also, um, so the first vignette uh, had the highest uh, willingness rates. And uh, also the autonomy over data collection. So people who could switch off or if, if, they, um, if they were told you could switch off the app, 
uh, were more willing to um, download this app, as well as the length and incentives. So the shorter study and those where people were promised incentives uh, yielded higher willingness. What about the Dutch studies? The picture there is not, um, well, in some in some respects is similar, so uh, order similar effects, uh, the um, sensor asked first uh, was uh, uh, yielded higher willingness rates and uh, university sponsor compared to um, the um, uh, to the governmental organization to uh, statistical office also yielded a higher willingness, but the market research um, was not significant. Benefit framing here um, actually um, uh, yielded a negative effect. Uh, so uh, if, if we tell people you can skip some questions, they uh, would rather answer those. Um, and in the second study, there are a lot of null findings. So only autonomy over data collection was a significant uh, predictor of uh, sharing um, the photo and of uh, uh, sharing GPS and willingness to share GPS. In all three studies, there were significant effects of smartphone use behaviors, but uh, mixed findings about privacy concerns and attitudes towards surveys and prior downloads of the ads, of the ad apps. Sorry. Um, what else did we find? So this this findings, a lot of null findings, uh, already hinted at this nature, situational nature of this study. So um, that or not the study, but the willingness that people decide um, e either hypothetical uh, decisions or actual decisions to share are quite nuanced and varied. So in this um, second study, the Dutch study with the list panel, we also um, had uh, the follow up request. So we asked people uh, again uh, uh, to share um, the question which was asked first. So if they were asked first to share GPS, then they got a follow up request to share GPS. And we see that the agreement rates, which are um, here measured by the Kappa statistic, are quite um, in the medium range. So um, there is not uh, much uh, stability going on in those um, willingness uh, requests. And um, what we also saw is that uh, we randomly assigned um, people to either receive this follow up request a month or six months after um, the fact, after the first request, but that didn't have any significant effects. So uh, what I'm taking away from that, uh, or what I would like you to take away from that, again, that this is quite um, um, quite dependent on a situation in which a participant is and uh, on how the requests are, um, um, what information they provide, uh, so for whom the data is shared, for what purpose and so forth. So this is not presented here on the slides, but we uh, also asked um, the reasons for non-willingness um, and what would um, uh, what would make people uh, decide differently, and um, this um, came out from those answers. So now the second uh, or the last bit of my talk is about non-response and non-participation bias. So of course we oh, we see that willingness rates maybe are low, um, but the question is well, does it matter for um, this uh, non-participation, non-consent bias? And um, how we assess this is that uh, in the um, third study, um, the one where actual measurements were taken, the data uh, of the survey was linked to various registries of Statistics Netherlands. And then um, the non-response bias, for example, was the difference between the mean um, from administrative data for respondents minus the gross sample. And then for non-participation, this was the mean for um, those who consented and those who responded. So here first, uh, the um, non-response bias. So you can see the um, sample values and uh, that um, some categories are overrepresented, some are uh, underrepresented um, in, uh, in the sample compared to the population. Uh, but overall, um, these are quite, uh, quite low, uh, except for maybe income. The average absolute bias is about two percentage points. So uh, what does it look like when we uh, compare it with non-participation bias? So here is a sea of numbers. I'm going to walk you through them. Uh, and uh, we see a, a number of uh, those which are significant, but 
Also, overall, they are not very high, so average absolute bias, um, except for sharing photos of the house, is um, four percentage uh, points. So, um, in essence, um, not uh, quite high. What also is uh, happening here is that um, some of the biases aggravate each other. So, for, uh, for example, for a number of households members, um, there are more people uh, who, um, who, uh, whose household includes two people in, uh, in the sample, and also those people share a, a photo of their house. Um, and some of the biases uh, actually mask each other. So, for example, if I look at the non-response bias uh, for home ownership, uh, and then those who would uh, take a photo of the receipt or who took uh, the photo in this case, then uh, if I add this non-participation, non-response uh, bias, then I get zero bias, which, um, as I'm saying, is masked in there. But um, some of the biases are higher. So if you if you look at urbanicity or education um, for uh, tasks such as taking photos of the house or taking photos of the self, um, they are um, above five percent. And uh, of course, um, as it is with the registries, uh, we maybe would want ideally to have, for example, an actual location um, to um, see whether people share their location depending on where they are. This is not possible, so we took proxies. So um, what uh, one would do is, of course, to look at the research question to uh, see whether these biases uh, are actually important and relevant for one study or not. So here I am uh, already uh, at, at my summary and implications, uh, hopefully well within time, uh, is um, what we take away from these studies uh, is that the decisions are quite uh, situation specific and quite nuanced. Um, and um, the nature of the task um, seems to be more relevant than the sensor itself. So basically taking uh, a picture of uh, oneself is uh, yields lower willingness or sharing than taking a picture of one's house. Uh, or, uh, as I said, with Fitbit uh, uh, wearing a, a bracelet, fitness bracelet, and GPS, similar sensor, but different task, different device. Um, then also clear communication of who asks to share and for what purpose seems to be key. And here I would like to um, refer to uh, the uh, construct of uh, privacy in context, context by Helen Nissenbaum. So basically saying that uh, people, information that people share is not inherently private or public, but it depends on who is asking. It depends on the circumstances and the recipient. And then what also is important is that the researchers, when they're asking for uh, sharing this data, need to strike a balance between maximizing sharing and providing detailed information about the data because otherwise it could backfire. So for example, what we did is that we showed um, the location of the respondents back to them. So here you can see the uh, implementation and it says, is it your current location, yes or no? And then uh, you saw in the slide uh, with the GPS rates that willingness um, was not identical to sharing. So people, when they saw it, um, they might have uh, decided not to share because uh, uh, we made this design decision of implementation like this. Also, there's ceiling effects which are possibly um, due to loyalty and trust in the sponsor. So our studies were implemented in panels um, other than the last one, but the last one also asked uh, those respondents who already taken part in one of the Statistics Netherlands uh, surveys. So um, that's also why we might not see uh, these effects uh, of benefits um, framing and of privacy assurance. They might already have high trust in the sponsor, which is driving uh, those mechanisms. Um, the last bit, non-participation biases overall appear to be small, but as I said, depends on the task and the researcher's intention, what to do th with this data. There's a lot to um, be uh, studied here, so I'm finishing up with a cliche uh, that we don't know much and uh, there's a lot of nuance, but um, I think this is exciting. It gives us more opportunities um, to dive into that. Um, and uh, here are the references to those studies that I have um, presented, so you are welcome to uh, read them and one of them is forthcoming, so uh, just write me an email and I will send you the manuscript. Thank you so much. Um,
Thank you very much, Paula. Very, very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. We have a couple of minutes for clarification questions at this stage. You will have more, more, more opportunities to ask questions uh, during the discussion session. But at this moment, if there are very quick questions, I saw one uh, comment rather than a question in the chat. There will also be an error due to errors in the population register or sampling frame. It was, uh, yeah, uh, one of the earlier slides. Sorry, could you repeat the, the question? So it's not a question, it's just a comment saying that there will oh. also be an error due to errors in the population register or sampling frame. Yes, of course. Yes. So um, this is one of um, this is one of the limitations also as well that uh, well, we I didn't talk about measurement also. I didn't talk about coverage. So um, there's a lot I didn't talk about which could contribute. Yeah. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions at this point. Thank you so much, Bella. Wonderful presentation. I wish we could do a proper <laughs> round of applause. Thank you very much. Very interesting. But as I say, we will have more time at the uh, after we have uh, we've had all three presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to invite our second presenter, who is Emily Gilbert from Center for Longitudinal Studies, University College London. And Emily's presentation title is Longitudinal Research Innovations in Data Collection. Over to you, Emily. So I'm going to start with an apology. I live next to an extremely busy airfield who are currently not flying at this second. But if you hear background noise, I'm really sorry. So I'm just going to try and shout over it. Um, so very briefly, just to acknowledge, we are hosted by the UCL Institute of Education and funded by the, by the ESRCD. What I'm going to talk about is a very brief introduction to CLS and what we do. I'm then going to focus on a couple of innovations we have in data collection. So mixed mode time use diaries and wearables to measure physical activity. And then talk a little bit more about some of the challenges around these types of data collection and some of our next steps. Now, usually I would balance this content depending on who I can see in the audience. As I can't see any of you, I'm going to try and do this blind. So I apologize if you know some of this or I missed something. So very briefly, at CLS, we run four major longitudinal studies, um, so they're all cohort studies. So we have NCDS, which follows the lives of 17,000 people who were born in a single week of 1958 in England, Scotland and Wales. The 1970 cohort is a very similar setup, so 17,000 people, England, Scotland and Wales, who were born in a single week of 1970. Then we host Next Steps, which follows just over 16,000 people born in England across 89 and 1990. And finally, the Millennium Cohort, or MCS, which follows 19,000 children that were born at the turn of the century right across the UK. And the two that I'm going to focus on today mainly are the 1970 British Cohort Study and the Millennium Cohort, or MCS. More broadly at CLS, we have recently kind of developed quite a huge work stream of different kind of developments and innovations in data collection and more broadly. So this ranges from innovations in biomedical data collection right through to participant tracking and engagement. I'm obviously not going to talk about all these at all, but if you're interested in any of them, please do email me afterwards. But today what I'm going to focus on is firstly mixed mode time use data collection, including the use of an app to collect that data and wearable technology to measure physical activity. So starting with time use, and this was specifically something we implemented in the Millennium Cohort Study. So we did this at age 14. So we have a group of 14 year olds. This would be the sixth time they participate in the study, and we were really interested in capturing their daily activities. So what their daily lives look like. And we decided to do this with a time use diary, but using a mixed mode approach. So primarily using a web based version and an app, but also a paper version. And the app was something that we felt was quite crucial at the time. So we knew that in 2015, which was when we conducted this sweep of the survey, nearly 70% of 12 to 15 year olds had their own smartphone, 45% had their own tablet, and far, far more had access to those devices in a household. We wanted to offer the 14 year olds a choice because we hoped it would increase compliance. And we wondered whether with an app in particular, this might encourage real time completion, which might result in higher data quality, right? So if you're completing it as you go on the day, you're more likely to perhaps recall accurately what you've done that day. So in terms of our research design, we asked every respondent to complete two diaries. So one was a random selected weekday, one was a randomly selected weekend day. 
And the diaries we used were called pre-coded light diaries. So respondents had 44 activity codes that they had to choose from to kind of backfit their activity to. And these were designed to be relevant to 14 year olds. And as well as asking what they were doing, we wanted to know where they were at the time, who they were with and how much they were enjoying it. And in terms of the mixed mode thing, we offered everybody first up either web or app and they got to choose between the two. But for those who didn't have access to the internet or didn't want to use an electronic method, we had a kind of backup paper option. So we're kind of comparing the three modes here. So if we start with the paper diary, this is a kind of traditional format. So very much grid based, you have all your activity codes down the left and then across the top, you've got 10 minute time slots. And respondents have to draw a horizontal line to indicate what they were doing for each time slot. Now, our web based diary looked incredibly similar, right? So we have this grid format again, we have these activities and you drag and drop using the cursor across these time slots to indicate what you're doing. And then the black bar at the top is like a progress bar. So it shows you which time slots you filled an activity in for. So then we thought about how we might translate this into an app. And it turns out on a very small screen, it's obviously impossible. So you have to use a completely different approach. So this was the app and it's completely question based. So the respondent answers a series of questions recording their activities across the day, as well as these other things like location, who you're with, etc. And another key difference here is the way time is recorded. So on the other methods, you have 10 minute slots. Here, users enter start and end times to the nearest minute. But we hope the data we get back would be pretty similar. So I guess our first concern at this point is, well, how many people are gonna to agree to do this? So in terms of instrument take up, the app was the option most commonly selected and then subsequently the method most commonly completed. So over two thirds of respondents who completed a diary used the app to do it. So we're off to a good start here. We've got pretty good take up rates. And then our next concern was quality. So in time use research, the gold quality, the kind of good quality gold standard, if you will, is that each diary should have less than 90 minutes missing in activity time. It should record at least seven episodes of something you're doing in the day. So you should be doing seven different things in a day. And you should be doing at least three out of four main daily activities. So three of either being asleep or resting, some form of personal care, eating or drinking, and some form of movement, travel or exercise. So if we use these criteria, we see that the web diaries yielded the highest percentage of good quality diaries, but the app's not far behind. So about three quarters of both of those are good quality diaries. And by contrast, we find that just over half of our paper diaries are considered good quality. So again, we were pretty pleased with this, right? We're pushing the electronic methods. It turns out we're getting some pretty good data back from them. So another way of measuring quality is number of episodes reported. So the number of activities you're doing in the day. And generally, the more different activities you report in the day, or the more changes in activity, then the better the quality of your diary. So we see that actually, once you've got rid of these diaries that are clearly poor quality, most people do or report similar numbers of episodes a day, with the web version winning slightly. So 18 different episodes reported on average. So very briefly in sum, we successfully used electronic diaries to capture daily activities of 14 year olds. And we saw that the app was the most popular instrument. So two thirds choose to use this mode. We also happily saw that the web and app instruments yielded higher quality data than the paper diaries. This wasn't particularly surprising. So obviously the electronic versions allow us to add a number of soft and hard checks on the data. So for example, if respondents reported spending very long periods of time on a single activity, we could flash up a check that says, are you sure this is right? It seems quite long. Or if there's gaps in an activity, we can flash up and say, look, between 10 and 11 a.m. you haven't reported doing anything. Do you want to add something? Obviously, for the paper diary, we have none of those features. So we really think those things improved the quality of diaries. There's two conclusions here which I haven't covered in detail, but are worth pointing out at this point. So we did look briefly into selection into mode and we do see differences. So particularly by sex, ethnicity and parental socioeconomic status. So different people, depending on their characteristics are likely to choose different modes to complete. And this might then drive subsequent measurement. And then looking at measurement, we then found that the web and app versions were generally most similar, which was unexpected given they are completely different methods of capturing time use data. 
but very positive for us, given that the vast majority of respondents did choose to use the app or the web version of the Time Use Diary. So part two, wearable tech. So this will focus on the Millennium Cohort again, so same cohort as the Time Use Diary, but also BCS 70. So why measure physical activity? So we know that physical activity levels are associated with other health and wellbeing outcomes, but we also know that measuring physical activity can be pretty challenging. So typically the large scale population surveys use self-reported data, but we know that self-reported physical activity can be prone to a few issues. So as you might expect, there's social desirability at bias at play often where people will report higher levels of activity than they actually do. We also know that recall is an issue. So very often self-reported data is captured retrospectively. So you ask somebody, how much activity did you do in the last week? There are issues there with what people recall and how accurately they can do that. And we also know that intensity of exercise is subjective. So this is quite important from a policy point of view. So policymakers kind of recommend certain levels of activity in certain intensities. But asking people to actually report that is quite difficult. One level, one person's kind of moderate activity could be vigorous to another person. So obviously a way of overcoming some of these issues is to use an objective measurement. And we can look at a comparison of self-reported activity and objective data using the Health Survey for England from 2008. So they collected self-reported activity data using the retrospective method and then asked respondents to wear an accelerometer for the following week. And then they compared the two estimates. So what they report is the proportion of respondents who met the recommended levels of physical activity in the UK. So if you look at the self-reports to start with, we see that about 40% of men, 30% of women say they met the recommended levels of physical activity. And if we look at young people, that's about 30% of boys and 16% of girls. But if we look at the activity monitor data, it tells quite a different story. So actually based on the objective measurement, just 6% of men and 4% of women met recommendation compared with 7% of boys and not even 1% of girls. So this kind of highlights the extent of issues around the self-reporting of physical activity data and the importance of trying to capture it using kind of passive or more objective methods. So as I say, two studies. So firstly, we have the Millennium Cohort Study, again at age 14. So we used a wrist-worn monitor, and in part that was made because there is evidence to suggest that compliance is higher with wrist-worn devices, particularly among younger age groups. The device allowed us to calculate these kind of objective, light, moderate, and physical, vigorous physical activity levels. We also piloted the Actigraph, which people might be more familiar with, but GeneActive came out on top in terms of kind of feedback from young people about the comfort and the obtrusiveness of the device, but also in terms of their compliance. So we went with this one. What we did was we asked them to wear the monitor on two randomly selected days, one weekday, one weekend day, and those were the same days they completed the time use diary for. So interviewers were in the household anyway, doing a social survey. So at that point, they explained the task to young people, told them which two days had been selected and they left them with written information. And we then sent them text and email reminders saying, look, can you please put the monitor on today? It's your day to record. And then after the recording period, young people were asked to post these monitors back using the post. So how did we do? So of those that were eligible to participate, 80% agreed to do so. Pretty reasonable. Of those who agreed, nearly three quarters returned the monitor to us. And then of the return devices, um, compliance with the rep, uh, the wear protocols was reasonably good. So just under two thirds wore the monitor for the full two days they were asked and a further 11% wore it for one of their selected days. So I'm gonna compare that to BCS 70. So the, the cohort born in 1970, and we collected physical activity data from them at age 46, but we used quite a different method. So we used an active file device, which is something that's worn on the side it's an accelerometer, so we can measure the same kind of metrics that we were looking at for MCS, but we can also distinguish between different types of sedentary activity, so standing, sitting, laying down, which is obviously of quite a policy importance for this group. So the protocol is slightly different from MCS in that participants had to wear the device for the full week following their survey visit. Uh, we had nurses involved because this was part of a really big biomeasure sweep, so we were collecting a lot of other biomedical information. Um, so nurses went in, did all these other bits, and at the end of the visit, 
they vacuum sealed the Lil's device, which is about the size of a 50p coin, so it's pretty small. But they vacuum sealed it so it's waterproof and they stuck it to participants' thighs using medical dressing. And then after the week was up, participants were asked to remove the device themselves and post it back. And we were also able to provide at the end of the week summary feedback. So in terms of compliance and return, we did a little better than MCS. So 87% of those that were eligible to wear the monitor then agreed to do it, which is higher than the 80% for MCS. And we had 92% of those devices that were placed returned to us, which is good. We lost far fewer. So yeah. just under two thirds wore the device for the entire seven days. And then a further 14% of people wore it for six days and then the rest are pretty evenly spread. And it's worth noting at this point that respondents were told if the device falls off at any point, please don't try and reattach it yourself. Just post it straight back to us. So we feel that's probably what was happening there. So I guess in sum across both studies, although we would have liked them to be higher, the response to the return and compliance rates for both cohorts are pretty comparable to other population based accelerometer studies. So in the end, we've ended up with physical activity data from nearly 5,014 year olds and 5,546 year olds. So that's really enhanced the other information we have about these cohorts. And I thought I'd finish off with a broader discussion of some of the challenges we face when implementing innovative methods on the cohort studies and briefly describe some of our next steps around these issues. To be clear, I don't really have fixes for these things. They're probably just useful to acknowledge at this point and perhaps think about more broadly. So I think Bella kind of covered really well these challenges we have with willingness to participate, with actual compliance and with bias that may result. So we know that take up rates for innovative forms of data collection tend to be lower than the traditional kind of survey response. And we see that with both MCS and BCS70 for the accelerometers and time use diaries, like far more people participated in the interview. We also know that those who refuse to participate in these novel data collections tend to be different from those who comply or can be different, which introduces bias. And I guess a further point about bias or where bias could be introduced is if data collection relies on the respondent owning a particular technology, for example, a smartphone, those who do and don't own those things may be different in some ways, which causes problems. Then we have challenges around measurement. So really understanding and being clear on what devices are measuring and whether that's the same thing we're aiming to measure in our self reports. And I think my stance on this is actually most often self reports and objective data are measuring two different things and that's fine, but they should be considered complementary rather than comparable. There are exceptions, of course. And I guess the other challenge we've really faced is feedback from novel data collection, particularly real time feedback. So respondents are really interested in this feedback. It may be a way to increase engagement and participation, but we have a real fear that real-time feedback in particular may impact behaviour. So I guess real-time feedback from an activity monitor is probably the clearest example of this, in that if people can see how they're doing, they might then adapt their behaviour to kind of what they see as improve. Then we have a few ethical challenges that we've had to overcome or deal with in the course of all sorts of different forms of data collection on the cohorts. So it's not always clear where data are stored. Is it stored on the device? Is it pinged directly to a cloud somewhere? And who has access to that data? So can participants access the data anyhow themselves? Can they plug a device in? Can they look in the phone settings to find the data, for example? Can the researcher directly access that data at the point or even the device manufacturer? And these things obviously all have implications from a GDPR kind of data protection point of view. Then we have the massive world of practicalities. So if we're using devices, then we have a risk of device failure and therefore data loss. And we really saw that with both activity monitors we used. Um, same again with battery life. So making sure we can implement protocols that take into account that these devices have particular lengths of battery life and you may risk data if you run out of battery. And I say that again from practical experience. We also know that matching data from devices to respondents can cause headaches. So you really have to take care when designing these innovative collections to make sure that if data from multiple sources needs to be matched up, there's a robust system in place that will do that. We've also found issues with storage, with processing, with archiving. So you can imagine data from 5,000 respondents from an accelerometer can be huge. And very often the sheer size and volume of these data files is problematic. And then more broadly, issues of analysis. Do, 
do users know enough about the data to analyze it using appropriate methods and are we doing enough to guide users through this process final set of challenges is cost so you have the cost it takes to plan and execute these things particularly if you're doing them at scale but also if you need to buy devices wearables for example the cost is decreasing, but if you deploy them on a large scale study, it's still extremely costly. So MCS, for example, each of our accelerometers cost £144, which cost us half a million pounds to cover the cohort. So cost is a huge challenge. And then very briefly on what's next. So I think some of those challenges kind of where we need to go and where further exploration would be really valuable. So firstly, understanding drivers of compliance. So who agrees to participate in these innovative data collections and who doesn't and why? And then complementary understanding measurement in more detail and the measurement bias. How accurate is the measurement? Is it really measuring what we think it's measuring? The other place we kind of want to do some research is looking really integrating data from user owned devices. So devices that participants already own, can we use the data from those to supplement the data they're providing as part of the wider kind of social surveys? So, for example, using Fitbits or other kind of personally owned activity trackers could be used instead of study owned devices. And the biggie for us, given all of our studies are longitudinal, is thinking very carefully about the longitudinal continuity of measurement and how these innovative methods can be used in the future to supplement our data collection activities without compromising the integrity of data in the end, without compromising the studies. So if you want to find out more, there are a few working papers and articles here about time use diaries and accelerometers, and data from our studies is all available via the UK Data Archive. Very much. Thank you very, very much, Emily, very interesting presentation. We have a couple of quick uh, clarification questions at this stage. So one of the comments in the chat box very interesting. Wondering how you recruited the diary study participants. Let me turn my camera on. Um, how do we recruit them? So they are part of a cohort that was recruited through their parents, um, essentially at birth. So we use birth registers, um, health records to recruit parents to ask them if their child will participate in this study forever, essentially. We go back to these children and now adults every few years. Um, so as part of a major collection suite, we just ask them, okay, as well as doing this interview that you usually do and filling in this questionnaire, could we ask you to do these this diary task? And everyone was asked and quite a few people agreed. Thank you. There is another question. I think you already answered this question. Definitely there was a slide. Which accelerometer did you use? I don't know if you wanted to say more or was all information? Already. Yeah, I mean, so it's the Genie Active original for MCS, so it's wrist worn, it measures on three axes, it's pretty commonly used in research. BCS70 was a set of thigh worn active PAL, which had been extensively tested on a couple of cohorts in Scotland, um, which we decided to use at the time. But again, it measures on three axes um, and provides us more information on sedentary behaviour. So these decisions were really kind of policy driven more than anything. Thank you. Another question. Do you know how often and when people enter data in the electronic diaries? Does this differ between app and web and different patterns? Did you notice different patterns during the day? Yeah, so my face says no. Um, so that was one thing we really wanted to be able to do. And it turns out the system that the fieldwork agency used to design those things didn't allow that. So we wanted to know whether data capture was in the moment or how often or when, et cetera. Those are things we can't disentangle, unfortunately. So if you're going to do it yourself, please make sure you find somebody that can do that for you, because I think it'd be really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. And the last question at this point, do you think that the use of technology meant that people acted differently? So did you observe Hawthorne effect? Yeah. Uh, a debate we have internally all of the time. Um, we did a lot of qualitative, so we did a lot of piloting of this. We got qualitative feedback from people in the piloting and people did sometimes say, yeah, I thought I would kind of increase my activity because I'm wearing this thing, but actually three minutes, literally three minutes later, I completely forgot I was wearing it. So we hope that for the vast majority of people, they didn't change their activity. And because none of them could see any feedback in real time, we hope that didn't influence things as well. Because I think if you had like a Fitbit and you can see the steps, then that would influence you, but they didn't have any feedback. So hopefully not. 
Thank you very much, Emily. There are more questions just arrived just now, but I think we need to stop at this moment and we'll get back to them after the discussion session, at the end of the discussion session. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation, very interesting. Thank you so much. And now I would like to invite our third presenter, who is Tariq Al-Bakhal from Institute for Social and Economic Research, University of Essex. And Tariq's uh, title of his presentation is Linking Twitter and Survey Data, Quantity and Its Impact. Over to you, Tariq. First of all, thank you uh, for having me and thank you to everybody for coming and listening uh, to these talks. Um, I think these are trying to move surveys forward, at least uh, to some extent, to collect new forms of data. And in particular, our research is looking at uh, trying to link survey data to Twitter data, kind of almost as a proof of concept, the idea of that we can move on to uh, more social media um, as this develops, as we kind of develop uh, our timing or our methodology and our um, ideas of how to do this kind of work and are uh, based on our findings. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleagues who assisted. Uh, we're multi-institutional working across institutions. Um, and so we're all involved in this uh, particular piece of work. Wanted to acknowledge them up front. Um, now, kind of moving into the background of uh, this idea of linkage um, or Twitter data in particular. Um, first of all, only 25% of British internet users use Twitter. So of course the population to some extent is going to be limited initially. Um, and there's differences within that population by age and gender and social class. This is common across many forms of social media, many platforms of social media. Um, there's also an issue of consent, which uh, Bella, Bella and Emily were both talking about. Uh, we have actually asked for consent. This is not the focus of this paper. I will touch on it again a little bit later. Uh, but not only uh, our research, but other research that have tried to look at uh, ask for linkage. Sorry, did somebody say something? I apologize. If I'm, no. Thought I heard something. Um, there was a, uh, a a low consent rate, generally speaking, less than forty percent. Um, and again, those were found to be different by age and gender. Uh, but also, there's been findings, uh, specifically the work that we were doing uh, on survey mode, the impact of what survey mode they were asked in. So what we are interested in in this particular paper is another particular challenge, and that is the data availability. Uh, there's going to be variation in the amount of data available. Um, Twitter, uh, survey data is more or less, you have an idea of what, it's a planned data set, it's rectangular, and you have some concept of what each respondent is going to provide in terms of data quantity. Uh, this is in some ways going to the diary problem of providing different levels of uh, information, Twitter in some level is, is very unstructured. There's no quantity that's the right amount or the wrong amount for a respondent or a participant in that sense. So there's a lot of variability. And this variability can reduce the precision of estimates. So we're having difficulty finding the signal and the noise to use the commonly uh, used phrase but can also introduce bias. If some people are more uh, producing more content than others, and those uh, that content is systematically related to the other outcomes of interest. So we're uh, interested in particular with this last uh, issue uh, in this paper. Just uh, some general ideas of behind linking survey and Twitter data more generally. Uh, there's been arguments that this can be a potential way forward in uh, trying to uh, use both data sources and the social sciences. A lot of times in the social sciences, people will say, oh, I want to use survey data or I want to use social media data. And they set each one up against one another to kind of sit and say which one outperforms the other. Uh, but they can also be used as supplementary data sources. And that's how we kind of view it uh, uh, and try and take it forward. Uh, there's some advantages. So survey data is, uh, you know, at one fixed time and point, 
whereas Twitter data can be uh, more continuous and a more real time and give you that real time feel. You potentially could create new measures out of the Twitter data that you don't capture in survey data, um, or you can capture social networks, uh, which are somewhat hard to capture in uh, survey data potentially. It also can reduce respondent burden to the extent that you can create these measures uh, and don't have to ask the respondent to then produce them in a survey. Um, so there is that possibility. Again, the caveat that it's among people who you have that information or that linkage from, but there is that possibility longer term to think about uh, the nature of how we could use this type of data. So, what is this particular research? We're, we've done a number of research uh, on, on this data and beginning to really get it ramped up uh, in this work. And we're interested in uh, what amount of data, so we've asked for consent, we'll talk about that, but what amount of data can we uh, gain from this linked data between survey and uh, survey respondents and uh, who gave their linkage consent? And is that data, the differences in data to the extent that differences do exist, is it systematically related to some respondent characteristics that we can sit and identify, potentially saying these types of characteristics may introduce bias or at least uh, 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 increases in variance, reduction in precision? Um, and, you know, does, is this, uh, can we actually show that there's a possible bias that we're introducing or a potential error that we're introducing in a substantive type of analysis that shows that the quantity matters. We uh, did this study using two surveys, uh, both uh, probability-based uh, panels. Uh, we used the innovation panel from Understanding Society, which is a mixed mode uh, web and face-to-face. -face. Longitudinal survey, obviously, in the past year, we've incorporated uh, telephone surveys significantly more. Uh, given the inability to uh, use face-to-face. -face. But at the time of asking for consent, it was uh, web and face-to-face. -face. Um, and it's it's a probability-based sample, as I mentioned, asking in the, uh, everybody over the age of 16, 16 and older in the Great Britain, doesn't include Northern Ireland. Uh, and this was done in 2017 when we asked for consent. Similarly, in the NatSend panel in 2017, we asked uh, for the same consent. We use the same consent question, et cetera. That is also a mixed mode uh, study, but it uses, at the time, it was using web and telephone at that time. It also has a slightly different population being 18 above compared to the innovation panel 16 above. For the most part, however, I'm going to be focusing using the innovation panel data, partly uh, because both kind of data sets look the same, the results look very similar, uh, and also just to give a, a more focus, so we're not trying to say, oh, in this one and that one, just a focused uh, view of the innovation panel, uh, and we can do some deeper dives in the innovation panel as well. So we ask uh, for consent in the innovation panel. Do they have a personal uh, account? And then a consent question, which also has a lot of help screens, a lot of additional information. This is the basic question, um, trying to make sure they have informed consent, balancing it with question length, making sure it's not too long and overly burdensome. Uh, and then if they say yes, what's their Twitter name? We use the RTweet package to uh, connect to the Twitter API. Twitter API allows you to uh, capture the most recent 3,200 tweets from a call. So you call on the API, 3,200 tweets are returned to you, the most recent. Now you could do it again tomorrow and you would get the most recent 3,200, so whatever they've added on. So you could keep doing that from this point on, but from any static point, the initial point, it's just the past 3,200 tweets. If they've done less than 3,200 tweets, you'll get all of them. It also produces um, tweet metadata, so about the information about retweets and time of tweets, et cetera, but also uh, user metadata, so information about their followers, uh, so how many people follow them, how many they follow, and whether they have a privacy status so they don't allow people to see their data or not. This is kind of the way that the data broke down. About 22% of the innovation panel said that they had a Twitter handle or used Twitter. Um, 
So uh, nine percent of the total sample provided consent to linkage. That's about thirty uh, some percent of Twitter users. However, uh, and then a slightly smaller number gave the actual username. Of those 163 that gave a username, 127 had a public account, so 78% of those, uh, whereas 10% or 16 had a private account, uh, where we found invalid usernames for 14. And then there was six people uh, who gave us a Twitter, it had a valid account, but the provide produced zero tweets. So at some level produced no usable data uh, from a content perspective. Um, from this, so this looking at the amount of data that we were able to collect and the amount of data that respondents are producing that we're actually able to link to our survey data set. The, one of the important findings is the variability. That was immediately obvious. You can see the standard deviations. Um, you can see the differences between the medians and the means and see that there's huge variability. The means are the minimums and the maximums. Uh, so the amount of tweets that we obtained uh, theoretically, if we were able to start from day one, we would have been able to get 36,000 tweets from one person, but one person or more than one person in this instance uh, would have only provided us one tweet, no matter what. So there's this huge variability in the amount of data. Similarly, there's a huge variability in the amount of people that uh, follow our respondents and uh, a huge variability in the amount of people that uh, respondents follow. And so these are uh, all showing really the amount of variability and the, the unstructured nature of the Twitter data that we're linking to the structured uh, survey data, creating a data asymmetry. So looking at, so that's our first question, is there differences? Clearly there's differences. Um, our second question is, is there differences in a systematic way among uh, respondent characteristics? So we were predicting the number of tweets. Uh, this is the total number of tweets that they produced because theoretically, again, over time, we'd be able to capture all of their tweets, uh, at least from a given starting point. Um, and so we were interested in total number of tweets and we saw that uh, females tweeted less, uh, people with uh, a certain level of degree, a level professional degree, uh, and I'm no expert in the UK educational system, not going through, through it myself, uh, but less than university, but more than O-levels, I think. I don't know. Someone who's from Britain can, can clarify later. Um, but uh, they tweeted more than other uh, educational levels. And the number of Twitter followers. So we were able to now see, here's where we're seeing the synergy, where we're able to use both uh, survey variables, so female and education, came from the survey, but number of Twitter follows come from the Twitter uh, metadata, and we're both, we're in, including both of them as independent variables. So we're seeing how these kind of uh, come together and can be used on either side of the equation. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps people with more followers tweet more, there's probably a good reason for that. Um, you can see that the remainder of the uh, variables that we included in our model were not significant. There was no uh, identifiable impact for any of these particular variables. Uh, so, you know, but there is some evidence that there is a systematic difference uh, in the amount of data that's being generated in this asymmetric data between our survey data and our Twitter data. Now, so that's our first question. Is there a difference? Yes. Is there a systematic difference based on respondent characteristics? Also, yes, on at least some uh, subset of respondent characteristics. And again, that's unique because a lot of uh, people who are doing Twitter uh, research generally don't have that kind of you know, data. They don't know if they're a female or what their education level is because they don't have the the structured survey data. So it's a benefit to both survey and Twitter data in that regard. The last question is looking at, uh, is there a potential bias due to the amount of data being uh, generated uh, across these users? So this is our third question. So we wanted to look at a particular example. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do is we're able to use sentiment analysis uh, which is 
you know, uh, a well-developed type of textual based analysis uh, using data dictionaries, using word dictionaries uh, that are pre-programmed to say, you know, here's the sentiment of a certain text. And I'll show that a little bit more in detail on the next slide. So can we say, based on their sentiment from their tweets, can we then say, does that have an impact on their general mental well-being as measured in the survey using a standard survey measure? In this case, we're using uh, quite about happiness uh, from the GHQ. Um, we simply dichotomize it as, you know, because it's a four-point scale on the in the GHQ. We dichotomize it, you know, happy and unhappy. It's obviously gross, but it gets the point across, I believe. And then again, we're going to run a regression. Uh, this time, obviously, a logistic regression, regression in terms of predicting whether this person is unhappy and uh, not happy, including uh, sentiment-coded analysis, uh, sentiment-coded tweets. So we uh, use the Bing lexicon. We also, for those of you who know sentiment analysis, there's also uh, there's other lexicons. Uh, we also looked at the AFIN uh, lexicon, for those of you aware, found the same uh, basic findings that I'm about to show you. So I'm just presenting the Bing lexicon. It's somewhat simpler to understand. Um, words are either defined as positive or negative. Within each tweet, we could then sit and sum up the number of positive words and the number of negative words within the tweet, take the difference between the two, and code the tweet as positive or negative. So if it's more than zero, it's positive. If it's a negative number, it's a, a, a negative balanced tweet. Then we could sum up how many positive and negative uh, tweets the respondent had. And we include that in our regression. So did uh, we included the number of positive and negative tweets that a person uh, put out. Uh, we uh, ha and found that the number of negative tweets actually uh, had, you were less likely uh, to be unhappy. So this is saying that it was a negative value. Uh, so there was this relationship that was somewhat unexpected, but you might imagine that people who were uh, unhappy uh, going to, to sit and uh, tweet less, they produce less content. Uh, that's one potential explanation. We're going to certainly look into that further, but at the moment, the important part is that it's significant. So the amount of content, the amount of sentiment coded at content is an important factor in predicting survey variables. So there is a relationship and there is this potential for bias. Is it bias or is it just error variance? That's something to be unpacked a little bit more, but there's a relationship. And that's kind of the important first step is identifying because there hasn't been this work or this uh, type of analysis out there to identify these linked data sets and the methodology in these linked data sets. Uh, number of uh, followers more likely to uh, say they uh, were uh, uh, happy female or, uh, or this is more likely to say unhappy, apology. Uh, more likely to say they were unhappy. Females were more likely, unlikely to say, more likely to say they were unhappy, which is one of these things that's consistent with the literature to some extent, these kind of survey findings on the GHQ, which gives us some view that our data has some base, you know, I don't want to use the word validity, but at least it's consistent on, on other variables that we're aware of. So it suggests that this number of negative tweets finding um, is, is useful and it's uh, predictive. The remainder of the variables were not significant. Um, and that, you know, is those were controls, partly to control for the variation and the amount of tweets that people were putting out, uh, as well as just general potential impacts on happiness. So, Question one, is there a difference? Yes. Question two, is there a systematic difference? Yes. Question three, is there a potential for at least the amount of data, the, the quantity of data to have an impact on substantive types of analysis? And the results also suggest yes. So at least these are things that need to be considered. Um, we need to be able to take that forward when we're doing this types of linked methodology. But it's also uh, important 
is that this is showing that this is a unique data source. You can use them, they supplement one another, they can be used in combined analysis. The types of frameworks and the types of analyses that we're putting together is informative more generally to social media because this is going to be true whether you're using Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn or whatever it is. There's going to be variables amounts of data, for example. Um, <clears throat> so these are just the summary points here at the end about also this variation that I've talked about in the impact. So I've rep not to repeat myself too many times, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and I wanna thank you uh, again for your time. Thank you very much, Tarek. Very interesting presentation. Couple of quick, very quick questions before we start our discussion session. Does the ethical review process cover more than just consent? Um, so, it, um, yes. Um, so we're obviously, that's the short answer. The, we're also interested in uh, a big part of what we're interested in is the ethical review of uh, how we're going to share that data with a larger respond or a larger user community, how we can store that data on secure servers. There's issues uh, in, in Europe for sure of the GDPR uh, that we have to take into consideration. All of these things are going into it. Uh, we actually, for those who are interested, there's a paper we actually published on the ethics of all of this. Uh, and the ethical part is not my specialty. So I, I say yes, and I say this general thing, but I would point people to the paper we published if they have interest on that. Thank you very much, Tarek. I think we have three more questions, but I think I'm very well of time. So probably we will have a discussion session first, and then we will keep the three questions, but they will be asked at the end of the discussion session. Thank you very much, Tarek, for the wonderful presentation. And over to Alex. Uh, can I? The discussion. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Can I confirm you see my slides? Yes, I can see your slide. Yeah, all great. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. So what we'll do now is I'll have just a few slides to kind of step back and think about what we have seen. Uh, have a few questions for the speakers and then I'll open up for Q&A with everyone. So I think uh, we all, we you'll agree with me that we saw a really nice mix of presentations and we got a taster of what's possible with the new forms of data and also some of the challenges that are involved. Uh, so here I just tried to kind of list uh, some of the new forms of data that we might think to link with survey data and use them together. We saw some ex some examples of this today, but not all of them. So other examples are survey paradata. So for example, data created during uh, data collection. So for example, aged uh, user strings in web surveys. Then uh, sensor data, and this can be of different types. So we saw some examples of uh, sensor data from mobiles or from, um, for example, Fitbit. Also, there are other types of sensors. So for example, satellite, GPS, and so on. Uh, social media data is another example of new forms of data we could add. Um, then we have also device or web or app usage data. So we didn't really discuss a lot about this, but actually looking at web browsing history, search history, uh, use uh, apps installed on a phone, for example, all of these could be potential information to link with survey da data. And finally, we have administrative data, which again could be linked to survey data, and we haven't really discussed today. Um, then I want to think a little bit about ways in which we can combine these different sources of data. So we can think of using the new sources of data as a complement. So I think a lot of the examples we saw today were in this spirit. So the idea is that we get these new forms of data and they give us extra information in addition to the survey. So in order for this to work, ideally we have uh, lots of people joining. Uh, we don't have a systematic difference between those that offer the new forms of data and those that don't. And ideally it's easy to collect. So we don't want to have a huge burden on the respondent and we want to collect this as easy as possible. Another perspective could be, well, let's just replace either the entire survey or parts of the survey with the new forms of data. So we can think, well, why ask about physical activity if we can collect it in a different way? Uh, why ask about uh, let's say uh, your income, if I can get admin data about your income, why ask you about media consumption if I can get it from your web browsing history? 
so ideally for this to work, we again, we would have low selectivity. So we have lots of people that offer us this information. And ideally, uh, we would have the same type of measurement quality. And we're really measuring the same concept in the two uh, data sources, which might not always be the case. And the third model, and we didn't really see that tonight, is that actually we could use the new forms of data as the baseline and then add survey to that. So an example of this could be, well, I have an app, I see you're using the app, and then I can uh, give you a pop-up question to ask you, well, what are you doing now? Or there could be a, a small survey depending on uh, if you're in a mall or in a particular area of the city. So then uh, we have the reverse where the new form of data is the baseline and then the survey brings additional information. And again, we didn't really focus on this, but this is also a model that maybe it's worth thinking about. So what are the potential strengths of these new forms of data? So sometimes it's more detailed. So for example, if we have sensors about movement, uh, that can give us a lot of information. Um, then we could actually sometimes uh, have better measures of the concept of interest. So we can think that sensors about movement are more precise and are closer to what we actually want to measure compared to something like um, a self-completion question about how much you exercise. And then it could bring have less burden for the respondent. So because we collect data using admin data or using an app, then maybe the respondent needs to do less work. Uh, some issues with these new forms of data, well, it can be highly selective. And we saw some examples of this. Uh, people didn't really talk a lot about this, but you can have technical issues. Uh, sometimes the app might not work because of a change in policy from the app provider, for example. Um, sometimes the measures you want to collect are actually conceptually different. So what you'd measure on Twitter, for example, is different from a self-report in a survey. Uh, conceptually, they're not the same. So one is public behavior. Uh, the other could be seen like a private answer to a particular question. And then the last point, uh, we, we lack sometimes consistency and control. So if we use sensor data, if we use uh, any social media data, then really at any point we can use access, lose access to that data uh, or the procedures in which that data is created could be changed. So if that happens, then we have no guarantee that we'll, we'll get good quality data. So as a final uh, questions or things to consider, I have this, these three questions for the speakers. Uh, so what will be, what do you think will be the role of the data you looked at in the future? Do you think it will complement it? It will replace some of the survey data you had? Uh, do you think the new forms of data can replace surveys or parts of the surveys or will always need the, the survey? And then what are the potential and the pitfalls of using the data in longitudinal studies, be it individual like panel studies or repeated cross-sectional studies? Can we use them uh, to answer kind of longitudinal studies and look at change? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each one of you maybe to answer uh, these questions related to the kind of uh, data you looked at, uh, and then we'll open up the floor. So Bella, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about this, these questions? So uh, these are. <laughs> if I start saying, uh, uh, telling you all my thoughts, uh, I think we'll, we'll need more okay, time. Okay, so maybe a brief. Uh, maybe I choose I'll, your favorite uh, question and your favorite answer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so maybe I'll just focus on on some of them. Um, well, first off, um, we we are um, looking or the. Um, the rationale why we started looking at how to uh, how how to explain willingness, what uh, the mechanisms are responsible for it is, of course, because we uh, want to implement it in uh, real studies. So Statistics Netherlands, for example, has carried out studies with apps and uh, sensors. And uh, this uh, also we have some experiments where uh, we looked at um, taking pictures, for example, by respondents for a housing survey uh, to replace some of the measurements, or as you are saying, to augment some of the measurements, whether people are willing to do so or not, in a real survey setting, right? Because uh, for what I presented, these were a string of requests. This 
probably is not happening in a real survey. So um, it definitely will uh, play a role in the future. And as I said, uh, this uh, not just the sensor data, but also this big uh, big data design designed big data perspective, um, where um, I think uh, it just mimics kind of what ha what's happening in the online research, right? So people started doing non-probability surveys and then shifted to probability based. So that's kind of like what's happening um, there from my point of view. Replace surveys, um, I don't think completely. I think augment is um, uh, more realistic. And uh, what is the potential pitfalls? I, I would leave this question for Emily, I think. Um, yeah. Because uh, she had some pointers on that. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Emily, do you want to maybe share your thoughts? Just very briefly. I mean, I think all of the things we have done at CLS to date has been to augment what we already do, right? So the intention for none of these things was to replace any survey questions. And indeed, in the surveys we've run, we've still had the self-report physical activity measures in part so we can do a comparison with the objective data and see what we're getting, but also an acknowledgement that actually they probably are measuring different things and that mm. people's perceived levels of activities are also important. So I think all the things we've done to date have probably just been to supplement, and I think that's fine. I mean, in terms of longitudinal, I think there is great potential. So what I didn't mention is for MCS at age seven, we also asked them to wear accelerometers. So now we have this start of a kind of continuous assessment of physical activity in that way. But again, this augments what we already do. I yeah. mean, more broadly in terms of pitfalls, I think the problems come as tech develops. So I'm thinking about activity monitors in particular, but again, at age seven, the device we used was very different. Mm. And often these things are quite black boxy. So something goes in and you're not entirely sure what then comes out. You don't know what algorithms have been used, for example. So quite the comparability of that data you think probably should be because it's objective is mm. not. So I think it's a potential and a pitfall at the same time, right? And that it really mm. does have the opportunity to add something. But there are pitfalls with this data on the way yeah. in a longitudinal context. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I mean, it depends. It's a good uh, answer for methodologies in general, I think. So <laughs> thanks for that. Tarek, any thoughts about this before we go to Q&A? Uh, just briefly, I think that there is a, a role for any of these types of data as we continue to generate more data as people using various devices, including uh, social media. I think it's going to be supplementary, uh, but also developing methods where you can kind of you know, uh, so the person I'm working with, Luke Sloan, he's a, a Twitter methodologist, social media methodologist, uh, and he wants to de be develop better tools for social media methodology based on this linked data because the surveys are kind of the gold standard. So hopefully he'll be able to take it away and, you know, reproduce some things using social media data uh, that we would be able to do in surveys only. That's kind of the idea, broadly speaking. So there may be some replacement potential there, but... We'll see. Okay, cool. Thank you. So now I'd like to open up uh, the discussion. So if you have a question, please press the raise the hand button and I'll name you and then you can ask a voice question. And if you don't want to do that, you can put it in the chat. Uh, I'll uh, I'll prioritize the people that use their voice. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> I, I miss the sound of human voice. So let's see, anyone has any questions? There are still questions in the chat box, yeah, from from after the presentations. So yeah, okay, we can go to that then if nothing else comes. Meanwhile, uh, okay. So for Tarek, for you, it was a question about GDPR compliance. Uh, if you have any more thoughts about that, uh, so uh, not my area of expertise um, per se. I will say that there's more thoughts to it. Can I uh, put a a citation in the ch chat box? Sure. Kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'll put a citation. It's the paper, like I mentioned, that we talked about the ethics, et cetera, about this. And then we do talk about GDPR in that paper. And so I'll put that there. People can kind of go as they like. Okay. And then there's a question, some questions about the sentiment analysis. So there's a question if you look at different proportions of positive and negative tweets instead of just if they're positive or negative. Uh, so not in the model per se, uh, in the analysis, we have looked at that more generally. There's more positive uh, tweets than negative tweets, for example. Um, the AFIN uh, methodology is a slightly more 
uh, scaly type of, <laughs> that's not the right word, but it's a scale of plus five to negative five. So uh, it kind of has a different methodology. We also look at that uh, to kind of see if there's differences in the way you measure that and broadly come up with the same kind of uh, results. Hopefully this work will be published shortly and people can go and see kind of more detail there. Yeah. Another question for you, Tarek. Uh, did you look at multi-part tweets? So did you look at, for example, answers and comments and things like that? Uh, no. And uh, so someone else, by the way, and I'm going to touch, touch on it because I saw it, was asking about the dictionaries of machine learning. So all of that, all of these are great ideas and definitely places we're going. We just hired a postdoc or offered a job for a postdoc to come in and do this because as a survey methodologist, my computer science skills are limited to this kind of sentiment analysis. So we have uh, thankfully went out and got somebody who hopefully will come in and be able to do all of these things because those are correct uh, things and we need to kind of expand the research to go in those directions. Okay. Okay, so any other questions, thoughts for anyone else there? There was another question about um, research. Uh, some research indicates that dictionary-based sentiment analysis, again, sentiment analysis, might be problematic and supervised machine learning seems better than dictionary. Is it a concern for the analysis? I guess maybe when you mentioned the postdoc that was already addressed. Yeah, yeah that was what I was uh, addressing, that question there in specific. Then that is true, what that person says. And so we're trying to move into the machine learning sphere by hiring the postdoc, again, a computer science type of person as opposed to a trained survey methodologist who's just kind of figuring things out on the fly, so. Thank you very much. There were some questions of, of, from after the presentation. Yeah, I think we just got another one. I'm trying to read it. Uh, uh, Tarek, I think it's for you. Do you want to read if you see has the comments? Has this has this been, uh, has this been, have you considered the purpose of Twitter has, has as, for example, tweet behavior from a personal account may be different from more detail. Is that something that you can measure? That's a good question. I don't know because I mean the way that we ask it in uh, in an innovation panel is we just say, can we have your Twitter handle? And potentially they could be giving us their business handle. I mean, or some kind of thing. Uh, so our, we're limited to what people give us in the the Twitter data, but that is a reasonable question. And, and that's kind of the beauty, by the way, of where I feel like this all of this research that we've been talking about is the potentials of where we go next. There's so many of these new research questions that we haven't been able to address and that we can now potentially. Okay, last call for questions. Otherwise we're calling it a day. So as I said, there were questions. Shall we go back to questions which were not asked to Emily? Emily, there were some. Why did you embark on this new way to collect data? So I guess a lot of what we do is policy driven and driven by science. Um, so what policy questions need to be answered at the time? And a lot of the things that policy kind of wanted, a lot of things we thought important at the time, were just not possible with survey data, right? Not possible to do it in a very good, robust way. So we thought, okay, we'll try something else, right? So there were lots of questions about social, social media usage, about tech use, about how young people spend their time in general exercise. And we thought, right, time use. So time use would give us that information. And then kind of saw other studies of trialed apps, for example, and thought, let's give it a go. Like there's really promising evidence. We've got a cohort to do this on, so let's try. And the same with physical activity. I mean, you can't ask enough questions to get enough data to tell you what we wanted to know. So let's try asking people to wear something. Okay. Thank you. There was cool. another question. Wonderful presentation. Thanks. Feedback to respondent is important for interventions while for surveillance don't want to change behavior. Could you block in real time info to respondent and incentive is to give them a read out after the monitoring period. I know we probably saw it. I'm a little bit confused about this question. Did you see this question, Emily, on the chat box? Yeah, and the one underneath it, do participants ask for feedback on their activity data? So yeah. in tandem, yes, respondents at the time couldn't see anything in real time. So their watches they were wearing, the side device didn't show them anything at all. It had a light on it to show it was on, that was it. 
Um, so the younger cohort never asked for feedback, weren't particularly interested in it. The, the older cohort really were. So when we were piloting and trialing, they were like, I want to see what I've done, etc. And that's exactly what we did in that we said, great, you can participate. And once you've sent the device back, we'll send you a readout of your activity. And we produce an A4 sheet in summary of what they've done across the week. And that possibly worked for the return of the devices, right? So 92% return the device compared to just three quarters of the MCS participants. So mm. yes, no real-time feedback, but the option of providing feedback afterwards, which was an awful, awful task. <laughs> but yeah, that sounds like a good compromise of uh, offering some information without biasing them. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's our time for today. I just want to thank our wonderful speakers. And I think we had like a taster of cutting edge research from three different institutions. So that was very exciting. And really thanks to Olga for organizing this. Uh, this will be put online. So a few of you have asked for slides, so you'll be able to see the entire presentation online. And like mentioned before, if you want anything edited out, please contact uh, one of the organizers and we'll try to do that before making this public. So thank you everyone for being here and thank you very much to all those speakers and to Olga. Thank you very much, and Alex. Thank you so much to you as well for organizing and for the discussion session. And uh, join our future events, which will be organized by RSS. Thank, thank you all very much. And presenters, of course. Many, many thanks to the to the wonderful presentations. I learned a lot today. Very yeah. interesting. Thank you. Thanks thank a lot. You. Have a very good evening, everyone. Enjoy our future events. Take care. Stay safe. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.